So I was asked to talk about quantum computer architecture. And um, I guess you might think that's how machines are organized, uh, which it is. But uh, I would say, um, as a classical computer architect who came at this maybe about 20 years ago, um, it's, it's a bit more than that. And what I'm going to talk about today is this idea of hardware software co-design. So really, the entire uh, quantum computing system, from algorithms to software to how the machine is organized. And in particular, I'm going to talk about our approach, which has been to look at how to design the system in a very physics-aware way. And what does that mean? Compared to classical software, I'm going to talk about really breaking abstractions and exposing a lot of the physics of the machines that we're dealing with. And the, the goal of that, especially in the near term, is to get much more efficiency out of, out of the machines that we have. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about uh, largely comes from this project called EPIC, uh, which has been going on for about five years. Um, it is what's called uh, an expedition in computing uh, from the US National Science Foundation. And um, I have this, we have this nice team of people that cover the full stack from algorithms to devices. Um, from algorithms people you might recognize, to uh, experimentalists, to a whole bunch of computer scientists in the middle. OK. So um, over the last five years, uh, EPIC, the project, had this goal. And the goal was to make algorithms two to three orders uh, of magnitude more efficient on machines. All right? And by efficiency, I mean use fewer qubits, use fewer gates, and require less fidelity from our machines. Um, so it sounds pretty ambitious. Um, it sort of depends on your baseline, really. Um, if you look at where the software was at the time when we started, uh, we took a pretty abstract view of these machines. Right? We had a, uh, uh, a pretty abstract gate set that we tried to compile to. Um, we had a whole bunch of different abstractions that we borrowed from classical computing. And what I'm going to do today is show you some examples of how we broke those abstractions and how that made things much more efficient. Um, and the significance of getting you know, two to three orders of magnitude from a sort of software and algorithms perspective, or using those mechanisms, is that if you look at historically how long it would take devices to get that much better, right? it would take 10 to 20 years. And in fact, this is an approach that's uh, typically followed in classical computing, that uh, companies that build hardware actually invest a lot of money in making software more efficient, because it's actually a more cost-effective way to make their machines better. <laughs> OK, so this idea of building you know, a sort of vertically integrated stack of software that is very specialized to the machines that we have is actually part of a trend uh, in classical computing that we call domain-specific software. Right? And in fact, um, you've probably seen this. Um, you know, a, uh, for example, big data and machine learning require some serious compute. And uh, we build, in fact, uh, tensor, TensorFlow systems that are hardware specialized and software specialized. Right? And so, that, so that's a big example of that. Um, and in fact, in classical computing, um, a few years ago, Hennessy and Patterson, who are sort of classical computer architects that you may have heard of, uh, in their Turing Award lecture, sort of pointed to domain-specific software as sort of the, a, a, an important way of going forward as technology improvements slow down. So you can think of the quantum computing stack as sort of the ultimate domain-specific layer Right? It's, it's uh, very specialized uh, for a specific sort of small set of algorithms. So there's a lot we can do. And so you know, here's just an example. Um, don't worry too much about the details. I'm actually going to get to this example later, you know, where we just start from you know, an algorithm expressed in some sort of high-level language. And then we compile down through layers that are very uh, specific to a particular device. In this case, uh, this stack we'll see later is actually trying to reduce crosstalk in superconducting devices. So 
Uh, in a nutshell, it turns out we were able to find many, many optimizations uh, that by using the physics of machines, we're able to make things much, much more efficient. Right? Typically about factors of two to 10. Um, large numbers like 10,000 come from when we look at the entire design space of different ways you can organize the machine and how the software interacts with the machine. I'll show you some examples of that. And it's been, it has been very successful. Um, it's been pushed out to industry. Uh, there's, uh, we have a spin out, a startup called Supertech that was acquired by Inflection. And uh, we have many of these techniques have actually shown up in uh, the way industrial compilers and academic compilers um, uh, now compile their programs um, for these machines. So, um, one thing that, you know, we should think about is, you know, we're in this sort of transitional time, right, where for the last few years there's been quite a lot of focus on disk systems, um, and we're starting to turn our attention to fault-tolerant systems. Um, and I can see that actually in the talks at this conference where we have NISC algorithms and we have fault tolerance and error correction that we've been talking about. So in this talk, I'm going to give you a lot of examples that are a little bit NISC-focused, because that was what we did in the last five years. I'm going to give you some examples that looked at air, uh, mapping error correction protocols to hardware architectures. And I'm going to try to give you some examples that sit in the middle, right? And I think our goal in going into the future is to try to build up this continuum of techniques from noisy machines to error-mitigated machines to fault-tolerant machines. Okay. So I'm going to go through a lot of examples today, right? Uh, we'll see how far I get, actually. Um, and uh, I'll stop periodically so you can ask me questions, because it's basically like three slides on each thing, right? So if you want to talk more about any of these things, I'm happy to. And we don't have to go through you know, all you know, like 12 examples of things, OK? But I'm going to go through sort of uh, different sort of physical device-aware optimizations that we first looked at. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about classical simulation and how that enables some of the things we want to do and actually enables optimization. We talk about benchmarking, uh, a little bit about error correction. And that's going to be the first hour and a half before the break. Okay? And then after the break, uh, Jonathan Baker, who was a student uh, in my group at Epic, now postdoc at Duke, and will be starting at UT Austin as faculty uh, next year, is going to talk about uh, a, a sort of a deep, you know, sort of four years of, of uh, verticals for Qtrits and Qdits. Um, and uh, that's sort of, it's sort of a nice story, because actually the first Qtrit work that we did appeared in QIP 2019, and it was uh, one of the three best papers that year, or best uh, posters. And um, I think it's sort of neat to see where that went in the last four years. So we'll go and revisit that. OK, so let's get started. Right? This is a, uh, the first example I'm going to give is uh, actually was the, one of our very early works looking at how to compile to uh, IBM machines specifically. And it, this was really maybe the first time that we realized that these machines need a different model than classical software would typically take, right? And this really just came from the fact that these machines varied so much day to day, right? So typically, a classical compiler will, will create a binary, and you can use it on any architecture or any instance of an architecture, say x86, any machine out there, right? And you don't change that binary. But what we found, of course, was that you know, this hardware varied day to day, right? And in particular, if you look, uh, the quality of the qubits here, right, where higher is better, and each of the one of those lines is a different qubit, varies quite significantly in a machine. And the worst qubit isn't even necessarily the same one day to day, right? And if you look at uh, two qubit gates between pairs of qubits, uh, similar thing, right? You can see that there's quite a lot of variation, right? So looking at this, sort of the obvious uh, motivation was we should, in fact, compile for a machine based upon its current calibration data, right? So very simply, right, we're going to recompile 
every time we have uh, uh, a new calibration. Uh, these machines are calibrated uh, twice a day. And simply, if we take a circuit, right, uh, an example there on the left, and, uh, you know, the, the traditional way would be basically to do a graph embedding, right? So we take that circuit and we minimize the distance between qubits that need to interact, right? And then, you know, the added thing would be the bottom picture where we basically avoid the bad qubits and the bad links, right? Here we've shown those in sort of red X's and grayed out circles. We avoid those and still try to keep things close together. This very simply gave about a 28x um, improvement in fidelity by avoiding those bad qubits and couplers. And it sort of just changed the way that things are compiled, right? So basically now everyone uses a noise-aware compiler and everyone recompiles based on calibration data. So the key here was to break the subtraction of compiling once. So that was very simple, actually, uh, but it showed us that we should really look beyond what, how we're used to doing these things. All right? So I'll give you another example. Um, so we're going to go sort of deeper. And so the first thing we do is also very simple. Instead of looking at a sort of an abstract set of gates, um, we're going to look at what, the, what are the native gates that are given to us by a particular machine, right? And this typically happens uh, under the hood, right? So if you uh, give IBM a C0, right, it's going to use some cross-resonance gates and some single qubit gates to give you that C0, right? Um, but here, what we want to do is expose those low-level gates to the compiler. Uh, and this is actually some work that uh, we did with the spin-off company and um, uh, the Berkeley Advanced Quantum Testbed. So in this particular uh, machine, it's a transmon machine. Um, it's actually meant to be a ring, but it's, uh, it's actually a line of four qubits, uh, the working ones. Um, and it has a particular set of gates, uh, controlled Z, controlled S. And here we're going to look at uh, a simple application. We're just going to try to do a uh, QAOA optimization on a max cut graph, on a graph for max cut. And we're going to map it onto this linear topology. And the thing that we're going to want to do is this ZZ swap. And what I'm going to particularly look at here is we're going to decompose this ZZ swap. And you know, there are a few ways we can do this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to move from the upper left, which is sort of the, the typical decomposition, and we're going to go to the top right and use the specific low-level gates that AQT, that particular machine, provides. But then what's interesting is there are a few other things we can do. Uh, since we have a, a CS gate, we can do it a particular way. And if, we're, if we were allowed to vary the angle of the C phase gate, we can do it in, in another way. But what's going to be interesting here is that we're, we're going to have a lot of different decompositions. Okay? And so we're specifically going to look at how do we decompose this in equivalent ways, right? So it turns out, um, you know, we can get 32 different ways that use CZ. We can get 64 different ways that use CZ, CZ, and CS. And then we can do some rewriting uh, and get us uh, some other variations on those things, right? And so this is going to give us a whole bunch of different equivalent circuits. And what we're going to do, actually, is randomly select among those decompositions and essentially do an approximation to randomized compiling. Right? Um, and if you're not familiar with randomized compiling, the idea is that if you randomize the circuits, uh, you will get, um, you'll take coherent errors and take them to stochastic errors. Right? So here, we're going to do it a couple ways. We're going to randomly select or also we're going to randomly select without making the circuits longer, okay? So that's the, the last option. And basically, what happens here is about a 60% reduction in error just by using this extra degree of freedom in the low-level gate decomposition, right? So 
this is there. There are a number of things, uh, examples of this kind of thing. But basically, it's useful to go down to the the actual gates that are that a hardware uh, platform provides. There are also other things like gate cancellation, things that wouldn't be apparent if you didn't look at what the hardware is actually doing. All right. Okay, so I'm going to go one step further, right? Um, and I'll just take uh, back up a second. Um, as an architect um, and a systems person, I would say pretty much all our best work comes from a conversation like this. I'll be uh, talking to an experimentalist, and they will say something like, I can do this thing. Can you use that at the system level, right? Uh, this is actually, this came from a conversation with Dave Schuster, who said, you know, we use optimal control for single qubit and two qubit gates. Why don't we use it for like a whole block of a circuit, right? And that's what we did. So if we take, you know, a piece of a circuit, right? Uh, the sort of conventional way to deal with it is you think of it as a series of gates, and each of those gates gets uh, implemented using a uh, with a sequence of pulses, right? In this case, uh, I'm showing microwave pulses for uh, a, uh, a Schuster's cavity-based system. Um, but if instead we treat that uh, circuit or that sub-circuit as an input-output function, which has a start state and an end state, and we hand it to our optimizer, which essentially does uh, gradient ascent, and looks for the shortest set of seek, uh, pulses that gives us an input-output relationship that we want, we get that series of pulses on the lower right, right? And so what you can see is it's considerably shorter and simpler, right? And so what we're doing essentially is you can think of, right, we're going from the start state to the end state in a straighter path, whereas those gray arrows are all those instructions that sort of go, take an indirect path from the start to the end state. Now, this is nice because the shortcut you know, is about 2 to 10x faster depending upon the circuit you're trying to implement. But the bad thing is you're doing gradient ascent on a huge multidimensional space, and it can take hours to a day to do this, right? Which initially seemed OK if you're just going to do this once and run this code a lot of times. But then we thought about it, and we are like, well, what about variational algorithms where every iteration you're going to have to recompile you might have to do this a lot of times. And that became a serious problem, right? So in fact, we took a look at this, right? If you're going to iterate on your quantum circuit thousands or maybe millions of times, and every time some of the parameters change and the pulse sequence has to change, there's no way that you're going to spend, you want to spend hours or days on every iteration out of a million, right? So for this particular case, it turns out, you know, if we take a look at VQE, it turns out that you know, very few of the parameters actually change in your circuit, right? So the solution is to sort of partially compile your circuit, figure out what the waveforms should look like, and then fix it up, right? Um, at least that's what it was in concept. The actual implementation was actually to search again for the whole thing, but using the same hyperparameters that you used for the previous iteration. Right? So it's, in some sense, still an incremental recompilation. So what does that do? That makes this compilation process, the search process, about 10 to 80 times faster. Um, and so, and it's still, it, it, it gives us about 2x speed up, which is actually not because the optimization is worse. It's just because for variational algorithms, that's about what we get. So, I think this is actually very promising, and in fact, I think uh, Jonathan will talk a bit about following this approach for QDITs, that sort of breaking the abstraction of gates and actually looking at pulse implementation of circuits is very powerful and interesting. There are also other interesting implications, uh, creating uh, pulses that are robust to noise, um, uh, you know, sort of trying to learn the Hamiltonian of a machine so you can do this pulse optimization, trying to do machine and loop optimization. All these things are relevant to this idea of uh, pulse-based optimization. All right. Maybe I should pause for a second.
Any questions? See, I think you need a mic. Test. Hi. Uh, can you talk about the sort of? Did you look at all at the noise characteristics that and how they changed when you went from this long sequence of pulse to this sh uh, sh shorter sequence of pulses? We have not explored that fully. Okay. Um, in fact, we sort of had to back off from this idea of doing like four, four or five qubit blocks just because real machines tend to be a little bit too poorly behaved to have a well-characterized Hamiltonian that we can optimize for. Mm -hmm. But like if you, um, uh, well, Jonathan's going to talk about like Q-quart operators we looked at and, um, and we're trying to run those on real machines and look at how the noise characteristics um, vary depending upon how we optimize the pulses. Okay. So I'd say that's work in progress. All right, thanks. This one up there. Hi. Uh, on one slide, you showed some different circuits, which are all equivalent. And then you said that you choose randomly one of the circuits. And this makes the compilation more efficient. Can you? Uh, I didn't understand why um, it makes it more efficient. Can you comment on this? Uh, you mean the part where we did the randomized circuits? Is that where you were yes. asking? Yeah, so that the, the idea is to make it more noise tolerant. Right, so it reduced the noise by about 60%, of the, it increased the fidelity by 60%. And so what does that mean in terms of efficiency? Um, that means that maybe you have to run fewer shots, or you can think of it as, when I say efficiency, I mean making the machine easier to build to run your computation. So if you can uh, make your circuit run with higher fidelity, that means, you know, you, you can build a machine that's noisier and still uh, get an answer from that computation. So that, it's a little subtle, yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe a foot. Me? OK. Me? Oh, OK. Thank you. Uh, so it's me. <laughs> OK, thanks. So, so, so maybe. Maybe a follow-up question to this uh, random circuit compilation. Uh, why does it work? Why does it work? Um, I mean, so in fact, the equivalent circuit averaging um, is sort of an empirical thing, but the ran randomized, bench, uh, randomized compilation is basically taking a coherent error and um, essentially twirling, moving it in different directions so that it essentially cancels out, right? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so for a person who doesn't know anything about the system architect, it kind of looked, the, the posting you did kind of looked like a optimal control like task. So I, I was wondering, like, so there is a hard speed limit bound you have for the quantum evolution, right? So when you do that uh, pulse optimization thing, uh, can you tell me like how much, like how close it is to the ideal theoretical bound? Uh, yeah, I don't think we know that. Um... In particular, I think for sort of arbitrary computations, I'm not sure how tight the bounds are. We haven't, so we haven't evaluated how close it is to ideal. Thank you. It's an interesting to think about. Just one more over there. So on the same slide, you mentioned the randomized uh, circuits. You also mentioned gate commutation rules, and I'm wondering how that works, since like mentioned what? Uh, like commutation rules so using. Oh yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering how that works because like a commutation rule doesn't say reduce the number of gates in the circuit. So how do you choose when and how to apply these rules? Ah, uh, well, so the commutation rules just give you more options, right? It's it's still the same. Yeah, it's the same number of gates, right? But um, we're trying to create as many alternative implementations of this same logical circuit, right? And then the sort of the randomization is just sort of randomly picking within that set of things, right? Does that, I mean, it doesn't, it, it's actually good that it's the same number of gates. Sure. Uh, it seems there, there would be like some kind of exponential blow up in the number of circuits that you generate. 
because there's a lot, which, of, a lot which, of different ways you can commute. Yeah, so which is good, right? Because you're not trying to, you're not going to implement an exponential number of circuits. You want to choose from an exponential number of circuits because you want as much randomness as possible. Thank you. Great. Uh, oh, okay. Um, hi, I had a quick question about uh, the decompositions that you had for the AQT. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. I think you had listed that when you do the decomposition for CZ, 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 you, uh -huh. had, like, you said you had like 32 unique decompositions. What does that mean? Does that mean that you have different locations where you can place the CZ based on the quality of the crosstalk or interaction? It, so for that one, it's not based upon the quality. It's just they're logically equivalent, right? So you, they're different. They're just alternate uh, yeah, places you can put the CZs and, and when you adjust with one qubit gates. Right, so um, since since two qubit gates are much more expensive than one qubit gates, it's it's, it's you you have some freedom in doing the sort of what's uh, in basically transforming the circuit, right, with one qubit gate. So uh, they're all sort of whatever's logically equivalent. So so given a noise uh, characterization of the entire layout. How would you pick one of those 32 decompositions to actually right. run? So in fact, the two pieces of work I talked about are separate. For this one, we don't choose based upon noise characterization. We're actually just choosing different options randomly. And so the randomization, the fact that you have many different uh, implementations that look different gives you a, uh, a sort of randomization in the entire circuit. And that is what gives you the the circuit averaging feature, which is similar to uh, randomized compiling. So you're basically trying to randomize the noise. All right. Great. All right. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks for the great uh, talk. I was wondering how scalable is these circuit optimization technique? Because, right. Like, we want to have it done before you run the circuit or you want to do it on the fly and do you think it is scalable up to like thousand qubits for example right so you will notice that many of the things we do are not inherently scalable um, because for example there's basically an exponential cost to the optimal control work but what we do instead was we limit the size of the block we look at right so in fact the optimal that work that I just showed on optimal control, the idea was to find good blocks to give to the optimizer, but the blocks can never be more than four or five qubits, essentially. So you'll notice that a lot of this system level work is trading classical computation to make the quantum computation more efficient, right? And there's only, it's only so far we can go with that. Uh, can I ask, so when it comes to for example, fault tolerant regime, when you have many physical qubits involved in one logical operation, do you think it is still uh, in the same line with what you're doing? I think uh, you're saying if, 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 we, if we have a fault tolerant mach machine? Yes, and when we work with logical qubits, when That's right. there's... Yeah. That's a big question. Um, and you'll see in many things I talk about today, um, some will apply and some will not directly apply. Um, generally speaking, I think that if you just look at, you know, like a you know, basic surface code implementation and you're just uh, sort of calculating syndromes and measuring ancilla, that's a pretty simple physical circuit. But, when, but if you start looking at other kinds of codes and you start looking at uh, resource uh, distillation and uh, new protocols that actually mix physical and logical operations, then you're going to get a little bit closer to these NISC-like circuits. Um, but some of, them will, some of these techniques will definitely have to be adapted into that situation. But that's sort of the big question, actually. Thank you. OK, I'm going to try moving on. I'll stop again in a couple examples. OK, so this is a nice example um, of using system software to, to, um, to create a capability that, that makes machines easier to build. Okay? So the idea is we're going to try to deal with crosstalk noise 
somewhat in software. And what that's going to do is going to make it so you don't have to build a, a sophisticated uh, a machine to avoid that crosstalk. And this is a little bit along the lines of, if you look at the design space of different machines, how do you think about it? What can you do uh, to make that system more efficient? OK, so when we talk about crosstalk, the primary thing that we're worried about is, here's a picture of an IBM machine. If we have two two-qubit operations, which are shown in black there, right? Those so black rectangles. So qubits one and two are getting something, are undergoing something like a cross resonance gate. Six and seven, same thing. Okay. What can happen is those two operations, if they happen at the same time, can interfere with each other. In particular, if there is a connection, in this case between qubits one and six, right? So there's resonance between those two things, and that will give you um, crosstalk. And experimentally, you can see that it actually can make errors uh, 10x worse on those gates as opposed to running them um, not together at the same time. So that's the crosstalk problem. So if we look at the design space of superinducting machines, you can have uh, qubits, and in this case, we'll, we'll talk about transmons, that are fixed frequency. And you can have connections between the qubits or couplers that are also fixed frequency. Um, that's actually the low left here. There, that's the that's how IBM builds their machines, right? And sort of in the upper right is the sort of uh, most flexible, hard to build version, which is both the coupler and the qubits can be tuned in frequency. The advantage of that is that you can actually essentially tune the coupler so it's off, so that you can isolate two qubits. And that's a, a hardware solution to avoiding crosstalk, by right? just turn the coupler on and off, right? And then in the work that I'm about to show you, we focused on this sort of intermediate option where you can change the frequency of the qubits, but you can't change the, the frequency of the coupler, so the couplers are still always on, okay? Now, um, why are machines this way? Um, you know, my view is that on the lower left, you have sort of the machine that's easiest to build. And in some sense, um, the IBM path has been to make very manufacturable machines where you can have lots of them and lots of qubits, and you can deploy them on the cloud, and, every, and they're available all the time, right? So I think of that as the manufacturable machine. And then the upper right, I think of that as the, uh, I don't know, the, the hero machine, right? It's, it's, it's the advanced prototype that does sort of the best of what you want. And uh, there are many fewer of those machines, and they're not as available, right? Um, and the middle machine there, you know, sort of a, some compromise between the two, uh, which incidentally, I guess, is the Rigetti design. OK, so what we are going to see is that if you have a tunable qubit, which is arguably a little bit harder to build, and you sort of use your software to use those tunable frequencies to avoid crosstalk, we can get about 13x better fidelity. And, oh, that's backwards. Um, and we could get about equivalent fidelity to the Google machine with an easier to build machine. And what do we do? It's actually pretty simple. We just take two steps of frequency assignment, right? So the first step on the top row is what we think of as uh, they're the idle frequencies. So these are the frequencies the qubits will be at uh, before you try to do anything, OK? And here, we just want them to be different. So we just do a simple two color of the system and make sure that no neighbors have the same idle frequency. Then the, the next step in the bottom is a little bit more difficult. That is, if you take a computation and you look at which things want to happen in parallel, then you have a graph of all the potential crosstalk, right? Now, what's very important is to only look at the operations that can happen in parallel. Otherwise, if you look at the entire dependency graph of the circuit, it's far too many connections and too hard to color. But what we can do is we can take just each time step, and it's a relatively small graph. And then we just do a simple coloring. Uh, typically, three colors is enough. 
And we just do that for every time step. We assign some number of frequencies for every operation. And that way, no neighboring operations will use essentially the same frequency and have crosstalk. And here we can see the results. Uh, so ours is the red bar. Higher is better. It's basically fidelity of the computation. And you can compare it against the blue bar, which is the sort of IBM-like machine. Uh, and it's about 13x better on average. And then you compare it against the green bar, which is the Google-like machine. It's pretty much uh, equivalent. Okay? So the idea here is look at a problem and use a degree of freedom to, in your software system to try to solve that problem. And in this case, make the system significantly easier to build. All right. All right. So let's take this a little further. Like that was an example of a simple design space for how do you build, how to avoid crosstalk. Um, in some sense, design space exploration is the canonical exercise of the computer architect, right? To look at all the ways you can build a machine and importantly, use uh, automated tools so that you can explore you know, many different design points in a very large space. So I'm going to show two examples of, in the trapped ion space of how to explore the design space. So the first one here was some work from our Princeton group uh, with uh, Ken Brown's group at Duke. And they were trying to get at this idea of how big of a trap should you build, right? And um, you know, at least Ken's view of, of, of the trapped ion world was, well, there are people who like to build really small, really good traps and then connect them together by moving the ions around. And there are people who like to build really big traps, right? And it's a little bit of a debate, you know, where, where should we be, right? And perhaps not surprisingly, uh, the answer after the design space study is we should build traps of about 15 to 20 ions, somewhere in the middle. But how do we do this? Um, as I mentioned, what you need is a set of automated tools, right? Uh, th what the Princeton group did was they built a compiler that could take circuits and map them and optimize them for different size traps and try to optimize the communication between them. In order to do that, right, they, they had to have uh, also the models of how much noise there was, what the cost of movement was, and things like that. And what they got out of this was, as I mentioned, it depends on the circuit that you want to run, right? For the different circuits they look at, sort of the optimal trap size is about 15 to 25, okay? Uh, what that gave you was uh, good local connectivity within a trap, and then, uh, but not too much um, noise generated by having too long of a trap, and then some amount of movement between traps to connect them together. Uh, and they also looked at some other things like uh, communication topology, um, you know, how do you connect the traps together, whether it's 1D or 2D, uh, and a few other things. They also looked at um, actually the, the kind of uh, modulation you used for the gates. So they actually got three orders of magnitude here, between the worst design and the best design, actually another order of magnitude for the different kinds of gate implementations. So this is one of those cases where thinking carefully about how you design your system can make a big difference in the efficiency of your system. I'll just take this a little bit further. I just think this is sort of a cute example, uh, maybe especially if you're a theorist. Um, this actually came from a, a suggestion from Chris Monroe that we basically build a Turing machine with a, with a trapped ion machine. <laughs> and the idea is, uh, you know, these machines have this thing, this uh, uh, acoustic optical modulator that allows you to, to, build, to independently control between 16 to 32 ions using um, unique beams, uh, each with their own frequency. And so what does that mean? Well. Because these things are sort of big, and they actually come from the chip fabrication industry, um, they're actually used to, to, uh, as the mask for um, fabricating silicon chips. Uh, 
Um, because these things have a scaling limit, even though you can build an ion chain that's very long, you can't individually address all the ions. Right? And so you know, Chris's idea is, well, you just take these ions and you move them under the head, sort of like a linear tape under a Turing machine head. And uh, you can do computation. You can do arbitrary computation. Right? And this had some pretty interesting things about it. Um, so one thing that you have to do is, if two ends of the chain have qubits that need to talk to each other, you basically have to slide the head along and swap the data so that they get closer and closer together. Right? So the whole cost of this machine is you have to move the ions around, and you have to swap data so that when uh, two qubits have to be both under the head so that you can do a two qubit gate, right? So to get them close enough. The sort of fun thing about this architecture was that there's this idea that, you know, in many of our systems, we have to do a, a data swap to move qubits closer together, right? Uh, we do this all the time in uh, superconducting systems. Um, but there's this idea that, well, since we're all on a linear chain, it's not that uncommon that one swap is trying to move right, and one, one piece of data is moving right, and one piece of data is moving left. So it's actually very, very common that, in this case, two swaps are swapping two things that want to move past each other, which is not actually commonly the case in, say, a 2D architecture. Right? So there's this weird economy of movement in these systems that we can optimize for. And so it turns out that this particular idea stacks on top of the previous idea, where you know, the optimal size is 15 to 20, or 15 to 25. But here, you know, we can maybe build modules of about 60 qubits or so by using this idea of sliding the qubits underneath. OK. Uh, I'll do one more example before I take questions, I guess. Um, here is a, a sort of a, another fun example. Um, and it's really breaking another abstraction that we typically hold. So typically what happens is that we think we need a particular set of gates to do computation. And we tell our uh, sort of device people that they need to support those gates. And, um, and even in the case where the, where the machines have their own low-level gates, it's usually a very small set. Okay? So, so Andrew Hauck, um, you know, who builds some of these systems, uh, said to me, you know, it would really be good if you didn't make me tune up a cross-resonance gate or a controlled phase gate or CNOT gate between every pair of qubits. Instead, what would be great is if you allowed me to have a different entangler or a different two-qubit gate between every pair of qubits. And that's because the qubits vary in frequency. And so sort of the optimal gate for every pair of qubits is different. And so if we give him that degree of freedom, he can make those gates 10x better in fidelity, as opposed to being forced to do the same gate for, between every pair. Okay? So this is this fun paper we call Let Each Qubit Choose Its Gates. Um, and this became an exercise in how do we find the gate, right? Uh, it's interesting. Um, if you look at the space of two qubit gates, um, up to one qubit transformations, you can think of it as this 3D space, uh, which we call the wild chamber, which is like this tetrahedron. And, um, and the gates we usually want are on the red and green lines there, right, in this space. Uh, things like C naught, C phase, or cross resonance, those are the ones we usually see. But it turns out that in a real machine, if you try to create those gates, you get this thing that we call a trajectory. So what the trajectory is, is uh, near the corner is the identity. And you apply a control pulse, and as you wait, you achieve the gate on the gates on the line, right? So the longer you wait, the further in you get. And the trajectories, it turns out, don't follow those lines that we want. 
like the XY or XX. So it turns out, um, you know, the gates that we want sort of sit in particular space uh, in this uh, tetrahedron. So here's something that we need a lot, which is a swap, right? So in a, a, a fixed sort of qubit scheme, like a transmon-based scheme, you have to move the data around. Lots of swap gates, right? So how do we get swap? Well, usually it's three C naughts, but there is this sort of space in the middle, that white space, which is uh, a whole set of two qubit gates that you can synthesize swap with three gates. It turns out you can also do it with two gates, but those are really slow gates, so it turns out three gates is faster. Okay, so we need swap, and it turns out we also need C naught. So we want to synthesize those things. These are different places where it could synthesize C naught also. So basically all the interesting stuff is in the middle. And it turns out um, after some, uh, some amount of design, we figured out that the way to find these gates is this thing on the top right. So if we want to swap, we basically start uh, on the trajectory of a pair of qubits. And that little red line starts in the corner. And then we follow that trajectory. And as soon as it crosses that plane there, and gets into the white space, that's the fastest gate that will give us a swap in three gates, essentially. So this is what we do. We essentially search for that crossover um, using simulation. Or we could use the real machine. And, uh, and that gives us the, the best gate for every pair. And what that gives us here is, OK, so there are two different schemes here. One scheme is only try to get good swaps and then get a C naught out of that. And the other one is try to get a good gate that could go to be as a compromise between a good swap and a good C naught. OK? And so that's criterion one is only optimized for swap. Two is for C naught and swap. And you can see, basically, if you compare the left, let me see. Right, so if you compare the baseline, you can see that the numbers get a lot smaller for swap and C naught as you go down to criterion one and two. And you can see that criterion two sort of uh, compromises between swap and C naught. You get a better C naught, where it's smaller is better, right? So. What did we get out of this? So we basically got an 8x improvement in terms of the error on these gates by allowing the hardware to choose a different gate between every pair. Now, um, this is not without cost. Uh, this means that we have to calibrate a different gate between every pair, right? And in fact, that finding the gate was essentially doing that. Um, so there's some complexity. But this was to sort of estimate, you know, you could get an 8x gain, right, by allowing this. And it really, once again, this is essentially assuming complexity in the software, right, to allow for variation in the hardware. Uh, not only does that make fidelity better, you know, it, maybe it makes the machine easier to build. You don't have as tight constraints on, um, on variation on your machine. And as you have a larger machine, you're going to have more variation. So all, relaxing these things is always interesting. Um, and along the theme of breaking our abstractions, the idea here was break the abstraction of having a uniform set of basis gates for your machine. All right? OK, I've been talking for a while. Maybe I should stop for questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Chan. I have a question regarding our way moving from near term to fault tolerance. And it seems that you have all been working towards this direction about um, incorporating the, the noise concern in your circuit synthesis. I wonder when you do this C0 circuit synthesis, um, what is the state of art in defining a cost function for a coupling between two qubits? I'm asking this because uh, up to maybe like last year, algorithms are using um, Steiner tree to derive a heuristic algorithm to to account for the architecture 
under underneath. But we we all assume that the the edge weight is equal to one, meaning that we think the coupling between every two qubits are equivalent. But as you mentioned, some coupling may be more costly. So I'm curious, how far have you gone in this direction, or have you thought about it? Yeah, I mean, um, so the very first piece of work where we just looked at the quality of the coupling, then there, when you do the mapping, if you have freedom in mapping, um, then you, you have a non-uniform cost, right? And you try to avoid high cost links that in, in, when you embed the graph, right? In this work, actually, it's actually mostly trying to synthesize a C naught that's um, you know basically equivalently good for all of the links, right? It's basically using freedom of of circuit synthesis to adjust for qubit for and coupler variation in in that in the work I just showed. So um, uh, I guess it sort of depends. I mean, in this one, we also only used a simple model of um, time, basically coherence time limited errors. So there could be more non-uniformity non in error that we're not modeling. So um, what would I say? I mean, it, it, I think um, in reality, errors will, like the cost will be non-uniform, right? And, and um, are you able to describe it using, for example, some district plus on district, you know, like Oh, I see. Like this? It, uh, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I think that it's like, for example, IBM profiles their machines, uh, they calibrate them because they don't, there's, it's not well understood what causes uh, variation over time, right? And so I don't think there are, you know, simple ways of describing it at the moment. Oh, great. And, and the other thing is, when you talk about canonical decomposition earlier, how do you reinforce this, canonis, uh, this can canonical form? Like, do you give it additional rules or how do you define it basically uh which worker which thing are you like it's sorry it's at the beginning um, at the very, you talk about canonical oh, the very form. beginning yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. uh it's you to uh, yeah. optimize zz swap using canonical decomposition that's right 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 um yeah i mean the, the, yeah those decompositions have um a canonical form so that we know so that we know exhaustively what they are so right. you define a normal form for the decomposition first? Yeah, yeah. There's, 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 I think there's a standard form for this. And do, is there any benefit for doing this? Like, I think that just helps us know what exhaustively what all the options are, right? Like we're trying to count all the options and we're trying to select from them. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you for the very interesting talk. So one of the reasons we use those abstractions traditionally is because they make things easier. It's easier to compile to a uniform basis gate set, for example. Uh, so would you mind giving us a maybe quantitative sense of the overhead you have to pay? So for example, if you stack up all these techniques, you get 10,000 improvement fidelity. Is that at the cost of 10,000 overhead and compilation time? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, so just in general, uh, yeah, there's no way we would assume the level of complexity that we've been assuming in, in all of these examples in sort of classical software, right? Uh, part of the reason that we're able to do this is because machines are small, programs are small, right? And so it's not like we have uh, millions and millions of lines of code or anything like that. So we're, we're able to in invest more in the compilation. Um, for that particular case, um, I would say that it's not so much in the compilation that wasn't that's actually not that difficult. It's it's in the calibration. So uh, you know, if you don't understand your machine very well, then you're forced to do some sort of closed loop calibration, which takes time. And um, you, know, you can see that on IBM machines, you know, they only calibrate twice a day because they don't want the machine to spend all its time calibrating, right? And so the more you add into that calibration loop, the harder it's going to be to fit it into the, you know, its downtime for your machine. So that, that is a pretty serious um, problem, I would say. Um, that, that would be the main challenge is to have, try to come up with very efficient ways to calibrate um, you know, a different 
gate for every pair. Hello. Um, I think what you're sharing here is really fantastic. I think that this is a really great way of attacking the problems that we're facing. Um, it seems to me that what's really important is that you have people developing algorithm software to be uh, really intimately aware of the challenges faced by the hardware manufacturers. And I think one of the major barriers to making that possible is uh, feelings of protection of know-how or, or intellectual property, these kinds of things uh, on like a higher level. Can you talk about how you see us as an industry being able to mm, do this kind of work more frequently given that we're operating under different like company names and things like this? Yeah, that is that is the big challenge, right? I think that uh, I think there's a lot to be gained in this sort of marriage of computer science and physics. Essentially, the first challenge is to find people or train people who understand both, uh, and that's something we've been trying to do. And um, you know, I like typically in my group, I I take students that have both CS and physics undergraduate degrees, so that's like it's a narrow set of people, right? Um, in terms of IP and, and industry and exposing, um, you know, hardware properties, that is definitely a challenge. I would say that, um, you know, kudos to IBM that they exposed, you know, their open pulse interface and, uh, and, and allowed, um, you know, the software to be developed at a, like a very low level. Um, that's been, I would say, a struggle with all manufacturers to try to um, to get that level of interface or even lower, potentially. Right. Um, I guess I would say that the hope is that you know, if a manufacturer exposes that low-level interface and you're able to get 10 or 100x efficiency on it, that sort of forces other manufacturers to do the same thing or just suffer not having that, right? And so, uh, but it's not, it's not an obvious thing, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, and and it, it, it is, you know, speaking from the other side, it is annoying to expose your low-level details because what if you want to change them, right? Like the whole point of having an instruction set architecture is you can change the thing underneath without having to change all the software, right? And so, um, but I think we're just in this phase of quantum computation that the efficiency can't be left on the table. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you understand why the uh, the two qubit gates are better? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there's no. It's like the sound is coming from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> do you understand why uh, the two qubit gates are better with two qubits than uh, than uh, other? Is it? Uh, do you understand the reason behind why uh, the, the, a gate two qubit gate is better with two qubits than uh, other two qubits? It, oh. it, it depends on uh, each qubit. What's the variation? Um, yes. Okay, so, I mean, in that example, yes, in it's, it's not necessarily that they're better or worse. It's just that certain, the trajectory is different, so you're, you're basically implementing a different gate, right? So, okay. so if you try to implement a gate that the trajectory isn't following, you're basically not quite implementing the gate, so the fidelity is not going to be good. But if you instead redefine the gate you're trying to implement to be the one on the trajectory and then have the synthesis of the compiler basically adjust with single qubit gates, then, every, then everybody will be good, right? But in that case, the variation comes from qubit frequency. Okay. And, and uh, what do you think about uh, quantum dynamic circuits? It, what was that? Quantum dynamic circuits in a circuit compilation. Quantum dynamic circuits, is that yes. what you said? Are you, so, so you mean things that dynamically adjusting for noise yes. and things like that? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, that those are great if, you know, yeah. if people can make them practical and manufacturable. But yeah, I mean, it, there's some it, it, it like zero pi circuits and things like that. Yeah. IBM. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, just a dumb question. I could parse the green diagrams with a white space in the middle, the triangular ones. One of these? Yeah, one of these. Yeah. What's so this? let's see. So the white space in the middle is is where you can. Uh, those those are all the gates that can create a C naught in two la two gates. So the two layers. So basically, 
if we, if we find a trajectory that goes into the white space, then we can implement a gate that with two of those and some single qubit gates, we can implement a C naught. Yeah, so all, all of the pictures were sort of, the middle is the good part, <laughs> basically. Hi, uh, you had a configuration space for possible architectures where you had tunable couplers or tunable qubits in a few slides back, 20, 25 slides back. Uh, I'm too far away. Yes. Where do you, how, where are we going? Uh, uh, this configuration space for... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a few slides back. This one. Uh, yes, so is there an inherent deficiency with the bottom right approach? The bottom right? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, yes, I mean, you, could, you basically, the, the tunable coupler would give you the, the ability to turn off crosstalk, right? That, that would be, but, um, so the interesting story about this is, if you remember, Google announced like a 72 qubit machine, and then like two years later, they announced like a 53 qubit machine. And that seems sort of weird, right? Like in the progression of things. But the difference is that the 53 qubit machine had tunable couplers. So every qubit basically had two tunable couplers attached to it. So it really was three, and each tunable coupler was essentially as difficult to, to make as it's basically a qubit, right? And so what does that mean? That means they basically did essentially triple the size of their machine, right? Um, what does it mean for this bottom right? That means, well, do you want to invest in building tunable qubits? Or do you want to invest in building tunable couplers? But there are like twice as many couplers, so it's sort of an expensive way to make the machine still. So in general, is a tunable coupler harder to manufacture than a tunable cube? Uh, no, I was thinking sort of, well, roughly equivalent, but there are more tunable couplers than tunable qubits, at least in a 2D. Like if, unless it's a, a line, you're going to have more couplers than qubits, right? So, that's, so it's, it's cheaper to be in the top left because you have fewer hard things to build than the top right. Okay. In the approach where you let each qubit choose their own basis gates, is it something you do once? You like you produce your device, you characterize it, and then you let each qubit choose the gates? Or do you have to do that on a daily basis because the device keeps changing? <laughs> yeah. Um... I think you you have to at least recalibrate every day, but um, in general, it's probably stable enough that you're not on a completely different trajectory. So you probably are in the same neighborhood. Um, yeah, so we probably don't expect to have to redo the trajectory all the time. But honestly, that work was for a relatively small prototype at Princeton. We don't really know if you manufacture a big machine what it would look like. All right. Let's see. I've got way too much material. Let's, let's think about where we want to get today. Um, Let me skip ahead a little bit, just so I can do some different kinds of examples. OK, so let's, let's do something different, all right? Um, I'm going to talk about the role of classical simulation uh, in sort of optimizing and evaluating compu computations. Okay? So here's some two, two interesting things. Um, this work on uh, quantum chemistry or variational quantum eigensolvers um, uses classical simulation to initialize the computation. 
Uh, and so it's sort of interesting. Uh, in particular, it looks at uh, a Clifford-based approximation of the onsets that you use in the variational algorithm. So what you have in you know, this uh, variational algorithm is, is this uh, parameterized circuit at the top, right? And um, sort of, if you try to simulate this circuit, um, it would be exponentially costly to simulate it, which is why we use quantum machines, right? But what's interesting is if instead you take a version of this and essentially discretize the angles in the parameterization so that it's uh, only Clifford gates, right? Then you know you can simulate this in polynomial time, okay? So the question is, is that useful? It turns out that it is quite useful. It turns out that if you take the initial onsets and you can simulate it relatively quickly on a classical machine, you can basically search classically for the best energy, sort of the lowest energy of that ansatz, um, and essentially search a limited version of the space that the quantum machine searches, right? And it turns out that it is uh, considerably better than the current state of the art, which is uh, this Hartree-Fock. Um, and you can think of it as Hartree-Fock is essentially um, a discrete uh, version also of uh, those settings of the parameters. And the Clifford-based search is based on superposition of all of those discrete Hartree-Fock uh, possibilities. Uh, and so what it does is it, if you compare the blue line with the green line here, right, you're basically, that's the energy of the system, and you're trying to converge to some lower energy, right? And you can see that the green line basically just starts orders of magnitude lower, and then you know, pretty much converges very quickly, right? So we've had really uh, good um, initial results with this kind of idea of essentially using uh, classical simulation, in this case, uh, of, of only Clifford circuits, um, to initialize these kinds of computations. Um, so why is this interesting? Um, oh, I don't have the picture here, but it turns out that as you make the bond lengths larger for this problem that you're trying to solve, um, both Hartree-Fock and this Clifford-based approximation get worse. And we can see, actually, that the Clifford-based approximation Gets, uh, has regions where it doesn't do well. And then we can do better if we make it sort of near Clifford, like we add some non-Clifford gates, okay? So what's interesting about that is that points us to this idea of near Clifford simulation, right? Um, so, you know, there's this um, uh, near Clifford um, circuit simulation um, that uh, IBM has, which is this uh, extended stabilizer simulator, right? And that was sort of, it, we've been, we had used that for some of this, but it turns out here's like a sort of a fun way to do it that turns out is about 100 times faster, which is we use this other technique, which is circuit cutting, and we can cut circuits apart and stitch them back together, but stitching them back together is exponential in the cuts, right? Um, and, uh, in fact, IBM has a uh, circuit knitting capability for stitching together small quantum machines and simulating a large quantum machine, right? Um, in this case, we're going to cut circuits apart and simulate them classically. In particular, we're going to cut them into Clifford pieces and non-Clifford pieces. So the Clifford pieces simulate very well because they're all Clifford. And then the non-Clifford pieces, in this case, are just going to be really small, like maybe a single T-gate or something like that. And then we're going to stitch them back together. And it turns out that, like for example, here, we're simulating something like that onsatz with, some t with in this case, a, uh, a single T-gate. And you can see that the purple one there is the extended stabilizer simulator from IBM. 
And it actually does well because it scales pretty well. It's pretty flat. Whereas like the orange line, that's a, a state vector simulator. And you can see that scales exponentially. And then uh, this blue line uh, is the circuit cutting technique. So it's, it's something that is actually still under review, which is basically um, uh, an unusual uh, application of circuit cutting, which seemed to work really well. Why do I bring this up? I think that uh, classical simulation uh, is, is a, a, a really useful tool for both trying to guide quantum computations and evaluating them, and potentially even um, you know, taking the place of some of your quantum computation in the system if it's, if it's a part that's classically simulable. Right? Um, this whole idea of knitting together circuits from different parts of your system or different, different subsystems, it, I think promises to, to give you a very interesting sort of heterogeneous system that can do larger computations, um, depending upon the structure of your computation. OK, let's see. Ooh, walking too far. And then, oh, here actually is an interesting simulation of you know, if you have, say, a surface code tile, and you have an error, but you want to simulate it not as a, a discrete, like a poly error, if you simulate it as a, like a continuous rotation, then it becomes a, non, a near Clifford simulation because you have an error that you have to simulate. And you can get considerable speed up here, once again, with this um, blue line here uh, compared to other approaches. All right. Um, so moving a little bit away from um, just breaking abstractions, um, another important aspect, I guess, of the you know, classical computer architecture discipline is a methodology for measuring things. And um, there are uh, you know, there are a number of quantum benchmark suites out there and quantum metrics, uh, you know, quantum volume, um, you know, uh, I guess algorithmic qubits from INQ. Um, there's a, um, a benchmark suite, which is basically a collection of all the quantum uh, programs we have. <laughs> Right? Uh, and so this is a different approach. This is an idea which is like, let's take, uh, you know, 40 years of classical benchmarking methodology and try to apply it to this, uh, how to benchmark quantum machines. OK, it says 60 years, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, so the idea is to try to come up with a small set of kernels that are somehow representative of things we want to do. And of course, this is going to change over time. But the idea was to try to come up with some sort of methodology. And the methodology we ended up coming up with was this idea of a feature vector, which is you know, features of a, of a, of a small circuit, uh, things like the circuit depth, like the parallelism, like the number of measurements, um, different um, sort of orthogonal features. And then the idea was to take those features and try to correlate them with how well machines did on these different benchmarks. And so I had this sort of nice set of pictures, which is like, you know, the uh, basically going out in different directions are the different features. And this sort of creates this like sort of fingerprint of each uh, benchmark. Uh, and right now, we have a pretty simple set of benchmarks um, which needs to grow. But the idea was to try to get some coverage. And the coverage is, is you know, different shapes, different, uh, you know, different combinations of features that you can have in this space. And so we have a, a metric for how much coverage we have. And, um, and here's the idea. is like we take this and we run this in all the machines that we can. And then we try to correlate different features to how well the machines did. Right? Um, 
So the reality is there aren't that many machines right now, and there isn't that much variation in the kinds of circuits we have. But one sort of obvious correlation came out with essentially how important is measurement to your benchmark, and how good is the measurement on these machines, right? And we can see that what happens is a very high correlation with machines that have either good or bad measurement, right? Um, and so the idea is, you know, to try to build out on this framework uh, as we get more diversity of machines and as, as we, uh, you know, come up with more uh, interesting benchmarks to run, uh, I expect that this will uh, expand in the sort of error correction fault tolerance area. So there's a couple simple error correction circuits here. Uh, and also will grow into the sort of variational algorithm space. Uh, when this benchmark suite was created, uh, for example, IBM didn't have their runtime capability, so you couldn't do multiple iterations easily. So right now, this is just single iterations. So by the way, the, um, at least in, in my experience, this was fairly unique that this was a really good example of a paper that was made better through collaboration with industry. In this case, our own company. but. Um, the fact that my university allowed this was great. And, and what happened was, you know, we had industrial strength software and the capability of collecting a lot of data in an automated way and optimizing for each platform. And it, I got to say that the paper was like 10 times better because it wasn't just made within the academic group. All right, so I'm running low on time. <laughs> OK, but I got to do this one because this is an example of how architecture can be matched with error correction. Okay, So this is a fun paper we did, uh, which is based upon this, you know, this idea that uh, you know, working with the Schuster lab, you, know, you can think of a, a, a resonant cavity as a small memory. right? So you have different modes in the cavity. You could think of it as like a 10 qubit memory, okay? And if we assume that, for example, so look on the right, on the top plane there is a, is a 2D array of transmons. And if you assume that each one of those transmons is a connected to a cavity, you can think of that cavity as a 10 qubit memory, okay? And what this is, you know, from sort of a classical architecture point of view, is it's a more than a 2D architecture, right? We actually would call it 2.5D. So basically, you have a 2D plane, but then you have essentially a, uh, 10 qubits you can store underneath the plane. And that basically can create a, la uh, a layered set of 10 surface code tiles. Right? So on the left there, you can think of, you know, that's what it would look like in 2D. You cut it up, stack it on the right. And what does that do? Well, um, it does some nice things. I mean, there's a trade-off. It makes the whole system much more compact. Uh, the main thing it buys you is actually it gives you uh, access to any one of those tiles underneath. Like, you can think of this as a random access memory, which means you can, you can actually interact the top tile with any tile in the stack. Okay, And what does that do? That means you can actually uh, perform a transversal C naught, so you can actually interact all the bits in parallel between any two layers. So the transversal C naught turns out it's about six x faster than uh, you know, um, bra braiding or lattice surgery. Um, it's nice, um, and but what are you paying? Right, you're paying for the fact that you have reduced parallelism. Right, because you can only with this stack of ten things, you can only interact any two of them, right? And then, then you have to in the next step uh, deal with other tiles. Oh, and then there's this sort of nice trick. So you know you have your array of data qubits, and you have ancilla in the middle. You can actually uh, squish this thing like that and use half as many qubits, but then you serialize the, um, basically, the X ancilla and the Z ancilla. Okay, so what does this do? 
um, we call it virtual logical qubits. In classical sort of terms, when you store something in memory and bring it back out again when you need it, you think that of that as virtualization of your resource. So what we're doing here is you know, virtualizing, say, 10 qubits. Uh, what does that do? It makes it so that you need 10 times fewer transmons. You have to have a cavity. Um, but what does that me mean? You can build right, 10 logical qubits right, with a very small architecture. Uh, and it has some pretty interesting um, uh, characteristics in terms of computation also. Right? Um, and for us, it was like going beyond two dimensions, but also like finding a match between uh, what we wanted to do, in this case, in this error correction protocol, with the physical architecture that we have. All right, so we're getting to an hour and a half here. Let me take questions again. Someone there. Oh, is this on? Yeah, very good. I have a question about the Kafka initializer. Yeah. Do you have a good way to sort of pick the best stabilizer to start with? Because if you have to evaluate all of them, it feels like you run out of steam very quickly. Yeah, I mean, it, it, no. I mean, it uses a Bayesian optimizer, so you sort of, yeah, I mean, it, you're searching a large space still. Yeah, it's, <laughs> right. it's, even, it's sort of larger than the one you started with, because now it grows, the number of stabilizers grows yeah. 2 to the n squared, which is very unpleasant very quickly. That's right. Yes. So it, 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 yeah, there's a big, there's a, a large classical problem there. Um, at the moment, since quantum machines aren't that great, it's worth it. But you know, in the in the long run, I guess who knows. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you for the great talk. Hello. Over there. <laughs> um, um, I also wanted to ask a question about the um, the Kafka algorithm, the VQE. Yeah. Um, so I was curious on like um, how much memory improvement you you get over something like the Hartree Fock uh, in initialization. Memory? Oh, you mean in terms of the classical memory that you need? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's it's it's much worse actually. It's it's not. Um, yeah, it's, it's really just the quality of the initial, like, where you're starting. But it's the computation is much, uh, yeah, much more substantial, in fact. In fact, you have to do a simulation, right? Uh, and you have to search a large space, so it's, it's a lot more computation. And then uh, I have another question about this, this uh, VLQ, actually. Yeah? Um, so let's say instead of... Uh, like cavities, you use uh, like like a spin photon interface um, with like that's uh, Zeeman split, so you can couple with the microwave. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so like like do, does this VLQ still work with that system um, if you substitute the cavity out? I with, think with so. I mean, it, basically any method that allows you to store multiple qubits. I mean, another you you could use you know you could use higher level states in a transmon, although probably be sort of expensive, but, but you know, anything that's reasonably cost effective or high fidelity uh, would work. I got you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, there. Yes. Uh, so the previous speaker talked about gains in error correcting codes by taking into account hardware noise models. You've talked here about sort of designing the hardware architecture around the structure of the error correcting code. Do you see opportunities, and if so, what opportunities for architecture to inform the design of error correcting codes? Yeah, I think, I think the, the most significant thing that I'm interested in is non-local communication, right? So a lot of technologies give you non-local communication. Um, and how can you best exploit that um, in making your codes more effective? I mean, intuitively, you're basically propagating information faster, right? And so, um, you know, what's the most efficient way to do that is is really interesting. Um, and there are, there are some there are going to be some physical constraints to that kind of thing. 
Um, you know, what's the distance? How much parallelism do you get? Um, how much uh, fidelity do you lose with distance? Those are all interesting parameters. Um, other kinds of physical capabilities would be multi-qubit or some sort or some sort of global operators. Um, you know, also whether they're local or have distance. Um, I think it would be very interesting to, to design codes around those capabilities. Uh, and there already are, I mean, you know, block codes are, are going to require non-local communication, so um, there is already some amount of that to think about. Thank you. Is my intuition correct that uh, for this Kafka thing again, Kafka finds you or tries to find the best stabilizer state and Hardy Fogg tries to find the best computational basis state? I think so. Okay. The Hartree Fock? Ah, maybe it depends on the encoding. Mm. If it's Jordan Wigner. Yeah, yeah okay. I probably don't know exactly the answer here. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, Professor Chan. Um, I have a question about um, circuit synthesis because right now we have a lot of interesting models developed for this problem. For example, last year at QIP, there is a catalytic embedding for quantum circuit synth synth synthesis. However, all of them have a very outstanding feature is we are assuming we're in a naive world where there's no noises and we assume that our gates are working exactly as we expect. So I wonder, as an expert in hardware software co-design, what your perspective on such assumption? And if you think there's something wrong about it, how can we incorporate noise concern in quantum circuit synthesis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, certainly in the sort of the low-level synthesis for uh, waveforms for optimal control, there's a whole area of robust optimal control, right? Mm -hmm. And essentially, you're trading off how optimal your solution is for how robust it is, right? And you can, when you, when you are optimizing for a particular waveform, you put in the cost function, you know, some amount of noise, right? And then that, uh, or uncertainty. And so you can, you can trade those two things off. So um, there's that, and then in more discrete synthesis methods, um, oftentimes you synthesize with some sort of noise mitigation, um, air mitigation mit, um, baked into your synthesis. So, you know, like IBM has echo sequences, and um, you might put dynamic decoupling in. So there are things that you might discreetly synthesize into your circuit also. Um, and then I guess, you know, the other thing that I, I, I think we're waiting for is for machines to be a little bit more consistent. Because um, some of the optimal control techniques, you know, just won't work if you have, like, uh, too much variation or uncertainty in your machine. Um, and so there's some meat in the middle of making the synthesis techniques more robust and the machines more consistent. Yeah, I recall earlier you showed us a diagram where you said um, the, the, the qubits are behaving differently on a daily basis. But we all know that if we measure the qubits, then we collapse the quantum states. Then how do we, like, how do we know that our, our qubits or our gates are behaving well and without like, you, destroying all this information? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's usually with fairly expensive tomography that you did a while back, <laughs> uh, right? And so, um, yeah, but you're making an assumption that it's still behaving that way later, right? Um, I mean, I suppose at some level, that's why you have error correction or flight qubits and, uh, and then some combination of error mitigation to, to make it more consistent even, after, even before you do that, right? Thank you. Yeah. So let's see. I have a lot more slides. <laughs> Where should we go with this? Okay, let's talk about decoders a little bit uh, before we break. <laughs> 
Um, break is now. Huh? Break is now. What is that? Break is now. Break is now, yeah. Um, we'll go a little longer, and then the next one will go a little later. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, one other aspect of, I would say, you know, quantum computer architecture is classical control and classical computation, right? Classical decoding. And, um, you know, there's probably not enough attention paid to this. Uh, you know, we looked a little bit at how to generate signals, how to generate signals in fridge. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is actually uh, decoding, right? I think it's relevant if you were um, uh, at the morning's tutorial, right? Uh, as codes become more complex, decoding becomes more and more complex, uh, especially for systems with fast clock speeds. Uh, such as superconducting systems, you know, decoding in such a way that you can keep up with the system can be very hard, right? Um, so one of the problems we have in cryogenic systems is you have to get the signal you know, from room temperature down to the qubits, right? And there's a fairly strict bandwidth constraint and, uh, you know, some latency problems with getting that signal down there. So one interesting thing is, you know, can you move some of that computation into the fridge, closer to the qubits? And, and you see that actually Intel uh, and Google and IBM have cryo CMOS implementations of hardware that does control, uh, not yet decoding, at the, uh, within the fridge. Um, but you have to be careful because the things that you do in the fridge, heat up the fridge. And so there's a very high penalty for any energy you dissipate when you're at very low temperature, right? Uh, orders of magnitude could be, say, 100,000 to one, right? Every joule of energy you, you pump out is going to you know, take 100,000 joules to cool down, right? Uh, and you, have, you basically have to be able to cool it down. So there's some basically thermal or energy budget at that level. Okay, so all these people have in-fridge controllers. Uh, actually, this is this nice observation from Barbara in 2015, that if you fall behind, right, what happens is your system is sitting there decohering while you're trying to decode the last thing to correct, right? And so you actually, you know, s sort of lose exponentially, right, if you can't keep up with the rate at which you need to decode and correct. Um, and so, uh, I can't remember, this was probably in 2021 or so, um, you know, we did a simple union find hardware decoder in fridge design, um, and, you know, found that this, uh, sort of, uh, blue line here, that's SFQ, that's, um, that's, uh, superinducting logic, actually. Um, can do quite well um, in keeping up with the system. And so if you have a, uh, like a software decoder, right, uh, which is that sort of orange line, then what happens is you fall exponentially behind and you have to keep increasing your code distance. Um, so, you know, back then we thought that was pretty cool. We, uh, you know, have a sort of a 10x reduction in uh, the resources that you need to do uh, error correction. But then, actually, just recently, um, sort of thought, I'm not sure why we didn't think of this, but um, uh, my postdoc, uh, um, Goko Rabi, noticed that, well, you know, 99% of the time, the errors are localized. And you can just build a really simple circuit. You only need union find when, sort of in the exceptional case, when it becomes ambiguous. And so when things are localized, you build these really simple circuits that just check the neighborhoods uh, against each other. Uh, and it turns out it's uh, like 25 to 80x lower uh, resource requirements than our previous design, right? And so um, what I got out of this is like this common case design, which is like the most basic classical architecture principle, um, really fit this case well. <laughs> 
because you know these systems you know have to catch the exceptional errors but the errors are actually quite uncommon right so uh, it turns out you can design something like this that's uh, extremely efficient um, and so I guess this is just you know I guess my last example let's say of of um, you know, there's there's a lot of work to be done in the on the classical side of how we control and decode these systems. Okay, so I think we should go on break pretty soon. Um, I can take some questions, or I can stand here and take questions if people want to walk up here. Maybe maybe now's a good time for a coffee break. Okay.